Father, just thank you for uh, how personally convicting Isaiah has been to me. Um, how relevant it is to today. It just shows me over and over again, Lord, that your word is living and active and supernatural. And that you know the beginning from the end of all things. And that you are <clears throat> in charge, Lord, of all of these circumstances, even though we don't fully understand. Uh, I ask you to build our faith, strengthen our resolve, encourage us, and help us to walk by faith and not fear. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're in Isaiah chapter 24. And so, uh, <clears throat> chapter 24 is basically about, anybody want to stay, take a gander and say what they think chapter 24 is about? It's okay if you don't. But what's the first sentence say? That the earth, likewise, that it's the end time. It's when there is the earth destroyed before the new earth. Destruction of the earth. That is what chapter 24 is about. It's I title it judgment and curse upon the earth, basically. And so, he is judging the earth. That's what's going to happen. So, just a really quick review. In chapters 1 through 5, the question is, what's wrong with my people? Chapters 7 through 12 are about King Ahaz. Then we have chapters 13 through 23 are the woes against the nations. And we were surprised to see in the middle of that that um, Jerusalem was a part of that situation. And in chapter 1428, Ahaz dies. So Ahaz dies in 1428 in, in the beginning really of the woes against the nation. In chapter 24, this is the rule of Hezekiah. So Hezekiah is king during uh, this time, from basically chapter 24 on. So it says, the Lord lays waste to the earth, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. And then it goes on to say, um, all of this is happening because verse 5 and 6 is actually the explanation. It says the earth is also polluted by its inhabitants for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. Well, there you go. That's pretty sobering. So, all of this stuff is happening because of verse 5 and 6 of, of chapter 24. Because men violated, basically they violated the law of God. And they brought a curse upon the earth. And there's a huge consequence. And the consequence to that is that uh, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. There is going to be fire that burns the men of earth. And there will be very few that are left. So, when we're looking at that, I mean, 
I just, 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 we don't have to write it down, but what is it that um, we learn which, as we read verse 2? It says, And the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor. What is he saying there, do you think? No distinction. They're all level to the same thing. Yeah. Your power, your money, your your position are going to mean nothing. That's basically what he's saying. He says in verse 3, The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, and the world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth will fade away. I mean, those are pretty stark Tough statements. That, that's uh, that's pretty tough. So we see that there's going to be in verses uh, one through four really kind of a complete destruction of world systems. Men and uh, authority. And so this complete destruction, we saw the first time that this has been talked about in Scripture is in what is the way that the earth was destroyed the first time. And where do we see that? By flood. Huh? By flood. By flood. So Genesis... Six through nine. So, when we look at Genesis six, it is a very similar description if you really think about it. He's saying in Genesis six that um, the earth is corrupt. All flesh has corrupted their way upon the earth, and he's going to destroy them. That's in six thirteen. But he says, "I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, and your sons." And this is for all generations from Noah forward. That, that's kind of an important thing about this. God is going to destroy the earth. By flood. Because men have corrupted it. And there's nobody left. That, that is, is, is worthwhile in any way. But then he says, but Noah, right? Noah will be covenanted with God. And it is going to be through all generations. And there's a whole lot about this that there was so much other stuff to talk about that, that I it just I really would have liked to uh, focus a little bit more about that. But here's the thing. Uh, it is uh, a covenant to do what? First of all, God says, I'm going to destroy the whole earth by flood. What is the promise that he made to Noah in his covenant where he puts the rainbow in the sky? What does that symbolize? What is God never going to do again? He's never going to destroy the earth by water again. Okay, he's never, doesn't say he's never going to destroy the earth. It just means not by flood. Okay? So he's not going to destroy the earth by flood, but it doesn't mean the earth cannot be destroyed. And so um, it's interesting that in, in Genesis 9, he makes this everlasting covenant with Noah, his descendants, and the earth itself, and everything that came out of the ark. Uh, you know, I've taught... Uh, Genesis before a couple of times and I studied it for different reasons and various other studies. But it just struck me how he's saying 
never destroy the earth, uh, the, uh, as he said here, it's just to make sure uh, that this is to the descendants, the earth itself, and every living thing that came out of the ark. Um, is it just man that's corrupted today? What what all is is corrupted today because well, of sin? Earth is polluted. We have polluted it and right. destroyed the ecosystems. Isn't it interesting that you know it's not that environmentalists are wrong in some areas. You know, I mean, I I don't think that. Uh, just different studies that I've done, different things I've researched. I, I, uh, I don't think that pollution directly is melting the polar caps, okay, because they've discovered 90 active volcanoes under the Arctic that are actively erupting and melting the, the ice from there. I think pollution is a contribution to it, it's contributing to it, but it's not the source. Uh, but the real source to all of this from scripture is the corruption of sin. Sin doesn't just affect man. It affects the environment that man lives in. Right? It just was a striking thing to me, especially when you go to Isaiah here and read all the things that God is going to do. Is God punishing the earth itself? Is the, has the earth done something wrong? Yeah. No, but he is, but it is a consequence to the sin. I think that is what is really still. Well, it says the earth is completely laid waste. Right. So, so what is that really directing itself to? What is it really talking about? Okay, we'll just, let me just uh, say Peter. Let's look at Peter before I keep asking questions that seem like they're crazy. Okay, 2 Peter 3, 3 through 10 says, the people are going to mock in the last days, saying, where is the promise of its coming? But they forget about the flood, that God has already judged the world by sin. But now, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, and kept for the day of judgment. So, what he's trying to say here is that Genesis 6 through 9 say that he is going to destroy the earth, but not by flood. Okay? 2 Peter 3, 3 through 10, are telling us something else. They're saying that people mock. But they forget about the flood. Now, the purpose of the flood was because of sin, and the whole earth was destroyed because of that. Okay, not the actual, you know, the, the whole earth was changed, I should say. The, uh, the environment that man lived in was completely and profoundly changed as a result of the flood. Okay, we had polar caps, we didn't have polarized caps before the flood. We, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there was a, tr a profound change in the way the earth functioned. And it was greatly degraded because of that. Yes? It hadn't rained before the flood. It hadn't rained before the flood. The water all came from the earth. It broke the foundations of the earth and then the rain from, from heaven mm -hmm. and uh, flooded the earth. And I believe, I, I did a creation science class on Genesis like too long ago to confess to actually. <laughs> and uh, I believe that they had figured out that that the water was probably 15 feet higher than Mount Everest. Wow. So that was, oh, wow. that's how high the water went. That's, that's what some of these scientists were saying. That's a flood. That's a flood. So, uh, <clears throat> But here's the connection to it. So, what's wrong with the people? They're, they're incredibly sinning, right? They're refusing to bow the knee to God. It says that, that uh, uh, man violated the law, brought the curse upon the earth. And then it says uh, God is going to destroy the earth again, but not by flood. 
But people mock, that's my friend over there, people mock the coming of the Lord because they forget about the flood. What is the problem? Well, they try to say it didn't happen. They're, they think they're invincible. Well, I think it's even more than that. It's a picture of the lack of understanding of what? What are people trying to deny? God. Not just deny God, but deny that they're bad. Deny that they're uh, wrong. They, they, they're they're their culpability. You know, their culpability in it. Okay, so when you, when you think about this chapter this way, when you, when you start to recognize what, what God is saying through Isaiah is these consequences are because you will not bow the knee and say, I am God, or confess your sin, or ask for forgiveness, or repent, or any of those things. They're not happening. That stuff isn't happening. It's not like God is waiting around to destroy the earth because he just really wants to destroy the earth. But, but there is a picture here that is being exemplified, if you will, by this uh, this set of scripture. But in Peter, it's even indicates the there's complacency. On yeah. It. Everything goes on like it has since the beginning of creation. Yeah. And that, that's when they're totally uh, leaving out the flood. Yeah. What is the problem here? That's what they're, they're saying. They're not studying. They're not. They're not keeping up with what God says. They don't want to know what God says. No. It, 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 I mean, when you really think about, it, do you know that? Do you know that person? Uh, and and I'm just going to talk about in the church. That person in the church who says all the right things but does none of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is the problem here with that person? What is it that they are actually saying? That you do, they're My not way is best. <laughs> My way is best. I don't need you. That's. That's basically what it is. And that's been the whole... Well, they just don't really believe what the Bible says. They don't. That's the whole underlying current of everything that's being talked about here. The underlying current of what is the problem and why God is having such... Uh, or I'm, God's not having difficulty, but why men are having such difficulty understanding this. I think if we were uh, less influenced by the world, we would understand Isaiah more easily. Because I, I, I can tell you, even for myself, when I read this, I'm like, whoa, man, that's a lot. That's a lot. Well, you know, it even goes back to when you're teaching your children when they're young uh, that you are to be in the world but not of the world. Right. That is a very difficult concept uh, for for young people, for a lot of people. Anybody. I mean, even as a, as a believer, even as a person who studies the Word. Even as somebody who really knows and understands, there's still people you love, there's still people you're concerned about, there's still circumstances that affect and influence your life. And so, uh, but, but the uh, finality of these chapters, it's ultimately saying, it's gonna happen. This will happen. And so, when we get to the next segment right here where it says, uh, I wrote uh, uh, when it talks about violating uh, statutes, it's an ordinance. And, and the picture of the idea was something engraved in stone. And, uh, and one of the commentators that I read said, it's like they have shattered God's ordinances and made their own rules. They've made a new stone with new ideas, new concepts, the things that they want to do. Uh, well, what, just think of what they've had to do to keep people out of places mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. because it's not what God wanted them to do. Right. Right. <laughs> right. That's good. So, verses seven through, uh, I guess it really goes all the way down to uh, thirteen. Uh, it talks about the new wine mourns, the vine decays, all the merry-hearted sigh, the gaiety of tambourine ceases, the noise of revelers stops, the gaiety of the harp ceases, they do not drink wine with song, strong drink is bitter to those who drink it, the seed of chaos is broken down, every house is shut up so that none may enter. <laughs> I'm thinking, yes, yes. <laughs> well, there you go. There's an outcry in the seats 
the streets concerning the wine. All joy turns to gloom. The gate of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city, and the gate is battered in, to ruins. I'm telling you, is, it, it, was this just written last week? Good grief. For thus it will be in the midst of the earth amongst the people, all, as the shaking of an olive tree, as the gleaning when grape harvest is over. Wow. So, it, that's the circumstances that they're dealing with. That is exactly what's going to happen. Then it says in verse 14, now this 14 through 18 was a very interesting um, little segment here because I had to really think about what was being said in 14 through 18. And this was very uh, convicting to me. I, I thought this is something we really need to pay attention to. It says they raise their voice they shout for joy. They cry out from the west concerning the majesty of the Lord. Therefore glorify the Lord in the east. The name of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the coastlands of the sea, from the ends of the earth, we hear songs. Glory to the righteous one. But I say, woe to me, woe to me, alas for me. The treacherous deal treacherously, and the treacherous deal very treacherously. Terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitants of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the windows above are opened, and the fountains of the earth shake. Okay. What he is talking about here in 14 through 18 is deceptive treachery. Now, how is this deceptive treachery? Think about what's being said here. What are people doing today with this disaster? If you're on Facebook at all, how many people that you've never seen quoting scripture are out quoting scripture right now? Right. All sorts of people. That's what he's talking about. People see the disaster and use it. And they're crying out, God. You're wonderful, you're glorious, worship the Lord, doing all this stuff, but what are they not really doing? They're not really. They're not really. They're covering their vices. You know, right. but God knows their heart. You know, right. Okay, okay but what is life. happening, what is the church doing about it? See, there's something about this that really struck me. And I thought, well, do we have the... Um, and, and, and let me just say it, you know, you have to be led by the Spirit. You have to know that it is God telling you to say it. But do we have the courage to say to them? Do you genuinely believe that? Or are you just afraid? What church do you belong to? What? <laughs> are you go actually going there? <laughs> have you read the Bible? Have you read the Bible? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm just going on and looking at the verses to share in the spare. Verses yeah. for healing. You verses can, for You can go in there and you can say, find images for a certain verse in the Bible, you know. Right. And, and there it is, you know. And all you have to do is copy and paste it. I have heard, so, and I have several of my clients who have sent me these long, I believe in Jesus Christ and I am a Christian and blah, blah, blah. And they sit in my chair, or they're in my facial room, and I know what they're saying. And I'm like, well, that's the first time I ever heard that come out of your mouth. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's like... I mean, um, there's all this stuff out there that all they have to do is copy and paste, and it means nothing to them whatsoever. Exactly. So what? So what does? where does that lead you? If you are doing something like this, what is, it, what is he saying is going to happen to them? He says... Terror and pit and snare confront you. So, in other words, they're they have deceptive treachery, and they say the right thing. But the outcome is the same: snare and the pit. And what was the third one? Uh, it will be terror. Snare pit, sorry, terror. Await you. Because there isn't any real change going on here. 
I tell you, it's, it's, I, I was reading this, I was like, man, that is just, that is so sobering. Because, you know, it's one thing to read about it and know about it, but it's actually, we're living in a day when we're seeing this actually playing out. Mm -hmm. And that is very sobering to me. All right, 19 through 23 are talking about two end time events. So I have given you uh, a lot of verses, a lot of extra charts that you'll get in your homework, and I'll talk to you just a little bit about it. But these are basically referring to the bowls of wrath. I'm sorry. I thought I'd turn this down. So, the bowls of wrath. And they're also talking about, uh, now I, I, I left in your notes a very extensive commentary by Tony Garland, so we're, we're not going to go through all of that, but uh, 19 through 21 is talking about pretty dramatic things that are going to happen. It says, the earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently, the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. It totters like a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. Wow. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heavens on high, that is talking about Satan, and the kings of earth on earth and man. It's talking about the punishment of Satan and his fallen angels and the punishment of man. So 19 through 21 is the bowls of wrath. Okay. Now, I also, I think you had, I don't know if I, you saw it in the back of your chart, but uh, the bowls of wrath um, are talked about basically, and I probably covered it pretty well in here, uh, in Revelation uh, 8 and basically 8, 9, 13, there's a, but starting in Revelation 8, it's talking about the bowls. I don't want to teach that <laughs> right now. But we are seeing the outcome of what that's going to be when we see this uh, destruction of the earth. And the bowls of wrath are the final seven bowls, or six bowls actually, that are poured. Um, so, um, You'll read that, and um, I just can't take my poor dad. He just really wants to talk to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so, uh, I'll just let you read that. So, the Revelation cross-references are in Revelation uh, 12, and then Revelation 19, and Revelation 22, Zechariah 14. There's another thing that happens and that is in, uh, which I gave you the chart for, uh, verse 22. So it says, they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will become confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Okay, so basically uh, the next little section here is talking about the thousand year reign but it's also talking about the battle of Armageddon. And that's gonna be 22 and 23. Now I gave you in your notes this campaign, and those that have taken Revelation got this already, but this is the campaign, and then on the back is gonna be the list of scriptures. So you'll get that, this in your notes. Um, one of the other things that uh, really spoke to me about 2 Peter, as I throw that kind of in there, um, it says in verse 9, this was something that I thought really needed to be written down on the board. In verse 9, it 
It says, the Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but the Lord is being, is patient. Not wanting any to perish. But all to know the Lord. So all of these things, this is this is the thing, you know, if it was if it was according to Kathy, you know, after after uh, the flood, I probably would just wiped everything out and just, you know, took care of heaven and earth, you know, Satan, the whole thing, right? And just dealt with it. But of course, we're coming up to Easter. We're coming up to the cross, to the crucifixion, to the reason why God waited so long, which was to actually redeem man. And that's a lot of what this is talking about. The Lord is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And our purpose on this earth, our plans, the things that we're to do, uh, have a lot to do with that. You know, because we have been redeemed, we have been saved, and we have the opportunity to be a voice to people who, by the way, what is the one thing that's come through clearly? Don't want to change, don't want to hear them do anything wrong, don't want to face any of the consequences. And so, uh, I think in the very first or second uh, lesson, I said, the most important thing here is not how much we know, it's how much we love. And uh, that really does come down to it because is there an exceptional amount of knowledge about what God is going to do? I mean, it's shocking when you go through all the books, all the Old Testament prophecies, all the things that were talked about in the New Testament and, and of course Revelation, how much uh, God has spent his time saying, I am going to judge sin. Okay, so it's not for a lack of knowledge of the fact that he's going to but judge sin. to read the Bible and do that. So, so you know that. Yes, but we who have read it do know that. And do they listen to us about that? No. What do they listen to? The feel-good stuff. They do, but they need to hear from us the love of God. When we get the posts, and I have a couple of people, I have to, when I see them again, say, do you really believe what you posted? And how are you showing that in your life? And that's love. That's not judgment. That's not saying, you know, look at what it says here and here and here. It's saying, I love you enough to say what you are putting down on your Facebook has to be followed through. It's not what you're living. It's not what you're living. And so what are we going to be called when we do that? Judgmental, opinionated. You don't know what you don't know who I am. You don't know what I'm doing. Um, but is that what God has dealt with? Is that what Isaiah has dealt with? Look at the example of Isaiah. This is a man when he got saved. God said, "You're going to go out to these people, and they're not going to listen to you." But it didn't stop him from going out and speaking. So I think the church needs to have a little bit of a uh, of a a mind shift about what we're doing when we see things like this. We are in a time that very much really mirrors a lot of stuff that we're reading. Are we ready for that? I have to ask myself, am I ready for that? Am I really ready for that? What that means? And uh, when we're tested and pushed, we tend to not always respond in the most loving way. I certainly have not responded in loving ways to those people that make you crazy. And so I have to say, God, am I listening to what I'm studying? You know, because ultimately uh, the flesh has got to be uh, taken care of. We have to deal with that. And so that brings us to uh, the cross references of Revelation 12. Uh, 7 through 12 is talking about uh, what we read about with the uh, punishing heaven. Revelation 19 is talking about uh, uh, the uh, campaign of Armageddon. Revelation 14 is talking about the battle of Armageddon. And then 2 Peter 3, 11 through 15. That was uh, 
really the question that we need to be asking ourselves. Second Peter 3, 11 through 15 says, what sort of people ought you be? Be people of holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the day of the Lord. Be diligent to be found in him, in peace, spotless and blameless, and be on guard. I kind of paraphrased it, but we need to be found in him. And we need to be on guard. And we need to be asking ourselves, what kind of believer am I? What kind of believer am I? Sobering, serious, and uh, so important. So, if chapter 24 was the end, we'd just soon quit right now and just go to our houses and stock up on food until the world blows up, right? But then we have chapter 25. And I'm so thankful for this chapter because the first five verses of chapter 4, right? Men violated the law, they're cursed upon the earth. The first five verses of Isaiah chapter 5. 25. 25, sorry. Thank you. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. Wow. This is the Lord promises deliverance. So, even in this, even though the earth deserves to be destroyed, even though men deserve to be destroyed, he says, um, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. The Lord is faithful. He is perfect. And we will exalt and praise faithfulness of the Lord. So then we get into some very interesting statements. Verse 2. For you have made a city into a heap, a fortified city into a ruin, a palace of strangers into a, is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Verse 2, I'm just going to tell you straight out, is talking about Babylon. A city never to be rebuilt again. Verse 3 says, Therefore, strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. So verse 3 is, I think... The earth bows the knee. And this could be a reference to the millennial, to the millennial reign. Verse 4, I mean it's like. Verse 4 says, For you have been a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress. A refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. I love that picture. You ever seen a really hard rainstorm? All it's doing is just bouncing off the wall. It is not taking the wall down. And that's the idea of what he's saying. So it is the remnant will be saved. And um, the wicked are like a rain against the sturdy wall that do nothing. Verse 5 says, Like heat and drought, you subdue the uproar of aliens. 
Like heat by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. So verse 5 is talking about <clears throat> silencing the ruth. The Lord silences the ruthless. That's amazing to me. So, then we get to verses 6 and 7. So, I'm going to tell you, I think this is referring to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It says in verse 6, The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. A mountain refers to Jerusalem. 99.9% .9 of the time when he talks about the mountain in Isaiah, it's talking about Jerusalem. So, the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. I don't like marrow personally. So, and on this mountain he will swallow up the coverings which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. So, six and seven is talking about the marriage supper And I, I gave you a chart uh, on that also that you're going to get. And then it's talking about uh, <clears throat> the swallowing up of death. So verse 7 is actually referring to uh, the veil stretched over the earth is a reference to death. And so this is a reference to God taking away death. And the references to that are Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. So um, he's going to actually even remove death, which is pretty amazing. And then when we look in verse 8, it says, he will swallow up death for all time. That sounds pretty promising, doesn't it? And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So verses 8 and 9 are really referring to Revelation 21. 1 through 5. And... Um, Sin and sorrow wiped away. So verse 9 is really, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So, this is sin, sorrow wiped away, and this is the salvation of his people. And that isn't just the Jews. <laughs> okay. So, um, I also left you a really... A uh, good little definition commentary from Tony Garland on the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I also gave you this uh, chart of a Jewish wedding on the back of that that you can read. Um, verses 10 and 10 through 12 says, For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab will be trodden down, into his, down in his place as straw is trodden down in the water of a manure pile. And he will spread out his hands in the middle of it, as a swimmer spreads out his hands to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pride together with the trickery of his hands. The unassailable fortresses of your walls he will bring down, lay low and cast to the ground, even the dust. Well, that's quite a contrast, right? It's right at the end of the rejoicing of salvation. And these are uh, the reminder, basically, verses 10 through 12. It's a contrast 
of the lost being judged. by God and um, it's showing that uh, the final outcome of them is going to be destruction uh, and no one is exempt. From judgment. Who is Moab? How are they in relationship to uh, Israel? They are cousins, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And we saw in the uh, in the uh, woe to Moab how God was sorry that it had come to this place that He had to judge them. And I think it's very interesting that Moab is listed at this point because it's it's a picture of the huge contrast between the family, if you will, those that were in the family uh, that God had called out. And Moab and Ammon are the result of incredible sin by Lot with his daughters. And so, but they were still in relationship to Abraham and could have been put in under that umbrella had they wanted that, but they didn't. It's just such a picture. So, verse 12 is basically the unassailable fortification of your walls he will bring down. He's basically saying in verse 12, you cannot escape the wrath of God. So sin does not escape God's wrath. So, we are at the end. <laughs> Just kind of plowed right through. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I hope you enjoy these, uh, the chart, the chart on the steps to a Jewish wedding, which has to do with the marriage supper that you're going to be reading about. And uh, this uh, chart on the uh, campaign of Armageddon uh, with all of the references. So I went through and looked at er gave every reference to each of the things that are going on in the campaign of Armageddon, which is, which is being talked about, like I said, over here. So uh, any questions? Can I, can I ask you for a... Um, Clarification. Okay. When it says marrow, I can't even find where it is now. Oh, right here. Um, could they be talking about the lifeblood of man? Oh, no. Let me look at that. Um. I'm, I'm saying that marrow was just the, it has the, the most nutrients. Well, it's the essence, is me. Yeah, so that, I was thinking that was the, the choicest. Uh, when it talks about choice pieces with marrow, you get mm -hmm. the, all of it there. So, where, where, I'm sorry. I'm it's just, um, verse, verse six, six and six. Okay, thank you. I was like, in 25. <laughs> thank you. Uh, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow. I think it's the best of the best. Basically, okay. what it is. Okay. I think he's just saying you're going to get the very finest, the best meat, and always bone in steak is always better than bone mm -hmm. out steak. I think is what they're saying. But yes, I mean that's what Frank says. That's the, the life. Well, I mean, when we get to the end of this, uh, what what is it that we uh, would say about these two chapters? I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Uh, he is basically telling us about the worst of the worst and the best if we follow him. Yeah. That's good. And it's sobering, isn't it? I mean, we're kind of... This whole study has been 
very sobering. I, well, part two is so great because it's all about Jesus. It's it's good. It's good. I mean, I just feel like we. I just read. think it's, it's like, just it's so heavy. It's so fortuitous yeah. that you yeah. chose this study for right now. I know. Who would have ever thought that it would? God did. Who would have thought? I don't think it was a coincidence. I don't either. <laughs> I, just, I don't believe in coincidences. Yeah, yeah, one of the uh, commentaries that I was reading uh, when I was reading about uh, the cover and the veil. Yeah. One of the commentaries was that God was the the veil which stretched over all nations was he was talking about death there because death comes to all of us right. and that's the veil that will be removed. But when he talked about or the covering or the, the veil. He talked about it being a, a face covering, and he even re, re, um, referred to how we even fool ourselves. Yeah, that's and good. everything, this veil that's going to be removed, is all going to be right out there in front of you. You will see yeah. at that point more clearly than ever before. And I, I thought, wow, that would I think that is great. I, I wish I had seen that one. That's really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the, yeah, the veil is the, uh, the covering is death, and the veil could be that. But I think he's, yeah. it's kind but of it's all the, the same thing. It's all in the same words. And I, of course, I was thinking about in Hebrews, that he, uh, we walked through the veil, which is his flesh, to get right. into the Holy of Holies, a sacrifice. It's also that picture of what it took. I mean, we could have just taken that verse and probably studied, I don't even know how many books. First, the veil was what separated us from God in the, in the right. Holy of Holies. And so right. this veil is now removed. There is no separation. That's right. And, and then when he talked about removing the veil of our own self-deceit, I was like, wow. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And that's a whole lot of what I think is another underlying factor with everything that we're talking about with Isaiah, with these first, uh, th this outline here. The problem with all of these people is they had a veil of self-deception. But somehow we think we're going to get around the situation our way. We're going to fix it and make it our own thing or whatever it is. But, you know, God loves me. He's going to take care of this. You know, I don't really have to do anything. It, you know, well, isn't that what churches, a lot of churches teach these days? Yes, it is. It says, let not many of you be teachers, for you will be held to a much higher standard. And I do think there's going to be a lot of accountability for that. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's, it's not fair to, um, uh, if you have the ability to speak truth, you should do it. Not mean in a mean way. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying we don't do that anymore. Very few churches really even talk about it. And then what, what is it that people start doing? They start complaining, why is God against me? Why is God getting me? Why, you know, why is this happening to me? Because we don't really understand that. If we could, even, and I, even as I've prayed about this uh, virus and all the things that are going on with it, I just re recognize that um, I get nervous when people say, oh, there's going to be a great revival as a result of this. I hope there is a great revival as a result of this, but I think I have to ask the question, what kind of revival? Right. And it's going to be rooted in God. Exactly. What is the revival? That, and last week we talked about uh, uh, the uh, 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 Shamil and the other guy, uh, Hakiel, how do we say his name? They were the chief of staff, basically, for Hezekiah. One of them was completely self-motivated. The other one was God-motivated completely. But in both cases, the people followed the man instead of God himself. And that's, you know, you shouldn't let yourself be fooled by men or follow men. You follow God. I, I, just, I just don't know. I just think we should... This is a birth pain. I don't believe that we're in the last... I mean, we are in the last days, but I think we're in the birth pains. I don't think we're in the actual tribulation period because I am a pre-trib rapture person personally so I think it's going to get bad I do but uh, one thing that Isaiah really says is that he takes care of his own he takes care of us now does he take care of us the way we expect to be taken care of 
or the way he knows we need. That's the other thing. We have to ask ourselves, if God is taking care of me, what, am I, what are my expectations? What does that mean to me? Does it mean that everything's going to go wonderful will be in my done. life? It has to be what he says. And uh, it'll be for our good and his glory. Okay. Anything else we want to say is very good. Did I finish early? I sure did. It's a miracle. You did. Yes. First time. I know. First time ever. Well, I didn't go through all those charts. But, <laughs> and lucky you. If you have any questions, you can call me about it or email me. Okay, let's pray. Father, just thank you so much for, uh, once again, uh, just humbling me. And, Lord, the question really is, how much do I love? I mean, do I really love people who are unlovely, who are lost, who are unkind, who are foolish? Am I separating myself out from people simply because I think uh, they're not worth it or I can't make any headway or, or I don't know how to say anything to them or whatever the reason is? I ask you, Father, to first and foremost lead us by your purpose and your plan and your will. Help us to forgive our enemies. Help us, Father, to seek your forgiveness. And Lord, give us the right word in the right season for that person that we know is really saying things out of fear and not faith, that we can speak truth and do it by your will and by your purposes and your plans, not our own. And I just thank you and praise you over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a tough time for our country. And so I just pray for all of our leadership, every person, our state, our local, our national leaders, that, Lord, you would be the one who controls and ordains and performs your will. And I, I pray for this world. Uh, six and a half billion people on this earth. I pray that you would be a voice that people turn and hear you and repent of their sin and confess and be saved. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.